Chapter 4 of Buried Alive by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 4 A Scoop. Within less than twelve hours after that conversation between members of the governing classes at the Grand Babylon Hotel, Priam Fowle heard the first deep throated echoes of the voice of England on the question of his funeral. The voice of England issued on this occasion through the mouth of the Sunday News a newspaper which belonged to Lord Nasing, the proprietor of the Daily Record. There was a column in the Sunday News, partly concerning the meeting of Priam Fowle and a celebrated star of the musical comedy stage at Ostend. There was also a leading article in which it was made perfectly clear that England would stand shamed among the nations if she did not inter her greatest painter in Westminster Abbey. Only the article, instead of saying Westminster Abbey, said National Valhalla. It seemed to make a point of not mentioning Westminster Abbey by name, as though Westminster Abbey had been something not quite mentionable, such as a pair of trousers. The article ended with the word Basilica, and by the time you reached this majestic substantive, you felt indeed, with the Sunday news, that a national Valhalla without the remains of a Priam Fard inside it would be shocking, if not inconceivable. Priam Fard was extremely disturbed. On Monday morning, the Daily Record came nobly to the support of the Sunday News. It had evidently spent its Sunday in collecting the opinions of a number of famous men, including three MPs, a banker, a colonial premier, a KC, a cricketer, and the President of the Royal Academy, as to whether the National Valhalla was or was not a suitable place for the repose of the remains of Priam Fowle, and the unanimous reply was in the affirmative. Other newspapers expressed the same view. But there were opponents of the scheme. Some organs coldly inquired what Priam Fowle had done for England, and particularly for the higher life of England. He had not been a moral painter like Hogarth or Sir Noel Payton, nor a worshipper of classical legend and beauty like the unique Leighton. He had openly scorned England. He had never lived in England. He had avoided the Royal Academy, honouring every country save his own. And was he such a great painter, after all? Was he anything but a clever dauber whose work had been forced into general admiration by the efforts of a small clique of eccentric admirers? Far be it from them, the organs, to decry a dead man, but the National Valhalla was the National Valhalla, and so on. The penny evening papers were profile, one of them furiously so. You gathered that if Priam Fowle was not buried in Westminster Abbey, the penny evening papers would, from mere disgust, wipe their boots on Dover cliffs and quit England eternally for some land where art was understood. You gathered by nightfall that Fleet Street must be a scene of carnage, full of enthusiasts cutting each other's throats for the sake of the honour of art. However, no abnormal phenomenon was superficially observable in Fleet Street, nor was martial law proclaimed at the Arts Club in Dover Street. London was impassioned by the question of Farr's funeral. A few hours would decide if England was to be shamed among the nations, and yet the town seemed to pursue its jog-trot way exactly as usual. The Gaiety Theatre performed its celebrated nightly musical comedy, House Fool, and at Queen's Hall quite a large audience was collected to listen to a violinist, aged 12, who played like a man, though a little one, and whose services had been bought for seven years by a limited company. The next morning, the controversy was settled by one of the Daily Record's characteristic scoops. In the nature of the case, such controversies, if they are not settled quickly, settle themselves quickly. They cannot be prolonged. But it was the Daily Record that settled this one. The Daily Record came out with a copy of the will of Priam Fowle, in which, after leaving a pound a week for life to his valet, Henry Leake, Priam Fowle bequeathed the remainder of his fortune to the nation for the building and upkeep of a gallery of great masters. Priam Fowle's own collection of great masters, gradually made by him in that inexpensive manner which is possible only to the finest connoisseurs, was to form the nucleus of the gallery. It comprised, so the record, several Rembrandts, seven Asquez, six Vermeers, a Giorgione, a Turner, a Charles, two Chromes, a Holbein. After Charles, the record put a note of interrogation, itself being uncertain of the name. The pictures were in Paris, had been for many years, the leading idea of the Duke Gallery was that nothing but absolutely first class should be admitted to it. 
the testator attached two conditions to the bequests. One was that his own name should be inscribed nowhere in the building, and the other was that none of his own pictures should be admitted to the gallery. Was not this sublime? Was not this true British pride? Was not this magnificently unlike the ordinary benefactor of his country? The record was in a position to assert that Priam Fowles' estate would amount to about £140,000, in addition to the value of the pictures. After that, was anybody going to argue that he ought not to be buried in the National Valhalla, a philanthropist so royal and so proudly meek? The opposition gave up. Priam Fowle grew more and more disturbed in his fortress at the Grand Babylon Hotel. He perfectly remembered making the will. He made it about seventeen years before, after some champagne in Venice, in an hour of anger against some English criticisms of his work. Yes, English criticisms. It was his vanity that had prompted him to reply in that manner. Moreover, he was quite young then. He remembered the youthful glee with which he had appointed his next of kin, whoever they might be, executors and trustees of the will. He remembered his cruel joy in picturing their disgust at being compelled to carry out the terms of such a will. Often, since, he had meant to destroy the will, but carelessly he had always omitted to do so. And his collection and his fortune had continued to increase regularly and mightily, and now, well, there the thing was. Duncan Fowle had found the will, and Duncan Fowle would be the executor and trustee of that melodramatic testament. He could not help smiling serious as the situation was. During that day the thing was settled. The authorities spoke, the word went forth. Priam Fowle was to be buried in Westminster Abbey on the Thursday. The dignity of England among artistic nations had been saved, partly by the heroic efforts of the daily record, and partly by the will, which proved that after all Priam Fowle had had the highest interests of his country at heart. Cowardice on the night between Thursday and Wednesday, Priam Fowle had not a moment of sleep. Whether it was the deep-throated voice of England that had spoken, or merely the voice of the Dean's favourite niece, so skilled in painting tea cosies, the affair was excessively serious. For the nation was preparing to inter in the National Valhalla the remains of just Henry Leake. Priam's mind had often a sardonic turn. He was assuredly capable of strange caprices, but even he could not permit an error so gigantic to continue. The matter must be rectified, and instantly, and he alone could rectify it. The strain on his shyness would be awful, would be scarcely endurable. Nevertheless, he must act. Quite apart from other considerations, there was the consideration of that £140,000 which was his, and which he had not the slightest desire to leave to the British nation. And as for giving his beloved pictures to the race which adored Landseer, Edwin Long and Leighton, the idea nauseated him. He must go and see Duncan Fowle, and explain, yes, explain that he was not dead. Then he had a vision of Duncan Fowle's hard, stupid face and impenetrable steel head, and of himself being kicked out of the house, or delivered over to a policeman, or in some subtler way unimaginably insulted. Could he confront Duncan Fowle? Was £140,000 and the dignity of the British nation worth the bearding of Duncan Fowle? No. His distaste for Duncan Fowle amounted to more than £140 millions of pounds and the dignity of whole planets. He felt that he could never bring himself to meet Duncan Fowle. Why, Duncan might shove him into a lunatic asylum and might... Still, he must act. Then it was that occurred to him the brilliant notion of making a clean breast of it to the Dean. He had not the pleasure of the Dean's personal acquaintance. The Dean was an abstraction, certainly much more abstract than Priam Fowle. He thought he could meet the Dean. A terrific enterprise, but he must accomplish it. After all, a Dean, what was it? Nothing but a man with a funny hat. And was not he himself, Priam Fowle, the authentic Priam Fowle, vastly greater than any Dean? He told the valet to buy black gloves and a silk hat, size seven and a quarter, and to bring up a copy of Who's Who. He hoped the valet would be dilatory in executing these commands, but the valet seemed to fulfil them by magic. Time flew so fast that, in a way of speaking, you could hardly see the fingers as they whirled round the clock. And, almost before he knew where he was, two commissionaires were helping him into an autocab. cab. 
and the terrific enterprise had begun. The auto cab would easily have won the race for the Gordon Bennett Cup. It was of about 200 horsepower, and it arrived in Dean's yard in less time than a fluent speaker would take to say Jack Robinson. The rapidity of its flight was simply incredible. I'll keep you, Priam Farr was going to say as he descended, but he thought it would be more final to dismiss the machine, and so he dismissed it. He rang the bell with frantic haste, lest he should run away ere he had rung it. And then his heart went thumping, and the perspiration damped the lovely lining of his new hat, and his legs trembled, literally. He was in hell on the Dean's doorstep. The door was opened by a man in livery of prelatical black, who eyed him inimically. Er, uh, stammered Priam Fowl, utterly flustered and craven, is this Mr Parker's? Now Parker was not the Dean's name, and Priam knew that it was not. Parker was merely the first name that had come into Priam's cowardly head. No, it isn't, said the flunky, with censorious lips. It's the Dean's. Oh, I, I beg pardon, said Priam Fowl. I, I thought it was Mr Parker's. And he departed. Between the ringing of the bell and the flunky's appearance, he had clearly seen what he was capable and what he was incapable of doing. And the correction of England's error was among his incapacities. He could not face the Dean. He could not face anyone. He was a poltroon in all these things, a poltroon. No use arguing. He could not do it. I thought it was Mr. Parker's. Good heavens, to what depths can a great artist fall? That evening, he received a cold letter from Duncan Fowle with a knave ticket for the funeral. Duncan Fowle did not venture to be sure that Mr. Henry Leake would think it proper to attend his martyr's interment, but he enclosed a ticket. He also stated that the pound a week would be paid to him in due course. Lastly, he stated that several newspaper representatives had demanded Mr. Henry Leake's address, but he had not thought fit to gratify this curiosity. Priam was glad of that. When well, I'm dashed, he reflected, handling the ticket for the knave. There it was, large, glossy, real as life. In the Valhalla in the vast nave there were relatively few people, that is to say, a few hundreds, who had sufficient room to move easily to and fro under the eyes of the officials. Priam Fowl had been admitted through the cloisters according to the direction printed on the ticket. In his nervous fancy, he imagined that everyone must be gazing at him suspiciously, but the fact was that he occupied the attention of no one at all. He was with the unprivileged, on the wrong side of the matted screen which separated the nave from the packed choir and transepts, and the unprivileged are never interested in themselves. It is the privileged who interest them. The organ was wafting a melody of Purcell to the farthest limits of the abbey. Round a raped space, a few ecclesiastical uniforms kept watch over the ground that would be the tomb. The sunlight of noon beat and quivered in long lances through crimson and blue windows. Then the functionaries began to form an aisle among the spectators, and emotion grew tenser. The organ was silent for a moment, and when it recommenced its song, the song was the supreme expression of human grief, the dirge of Chopin, wrapping the whole cathedral in heavy folds of sorrow. And as that appeal expired in the pulsating air, the fresh voices of little boys, sweeter even than grief, rose in the distance. It was at this point that Priam Fowl described Lady Sophia Entwistle, a tall, veiled figure in full mourning. She had come among the comparatively unprivileged to his funeral, Doubtless influence such as hers could have obtained her a seat in the transept, but she had preferred the secluded humility of the nave. She had come from Paris for his funeral. She was weeping for her affianced. She stood there actually within ten yards of him. She had not caught sight of him, but she might do so at any moment, and she was slowly approaching the spot where he trembled. He fled, with nothing in his heart but resentment against her. She had not proposed to him, he had proposed to her. She had not thrown him aside, he had thrown her aside. He was not one of her mistakes, she was one of his mistakes. Not she, but he, had been propitious, impulsive, hasty. Yet he hated her. He genuinely thought she had sinned against him, and that she ought to be exterminated. He condemned her for all manner of things as to which she had had no choice. For instance, the irregularity of her teeth, and the hollow under her chin, and the little tricks of deportment which are always developed by a spinster as she reaches forty. He fled in terror of her. 
If you should have a glimpse of him and should recognise him, the consequence would be absolutely disastrous. Disastrous in every way. And a period of publicity would dawn for him such as he could not possibly contemplate either in cold blood or war. He fled blindly, insinuating himself through the crowd until he reached a grill in which was a gate ajar. His strange stare must have affrighted the guardian of the gate, for the robed fellow stood away, and Priam passed within the grill, which were winding steps, which he mounted. Up the steps ran coils of fire hose. He heard the click of the gate as the attendant shut it, and he was thankful for an escape. The steps led to the organ loft perched on the top of the massive screen. The organist was seated behind a half-drawn curtain under shaded electric lights, and on the ample platform, whose parapet overlooked the choir, were two young men who whispered with the organist. None of the three even glanced at Priam. Priam sat down on a Windsor chair, fearfully like an intruder, his face towards the choir. The whisper ceased. The organist's fingers began to move over five rows of keys and over scores of stops, while his feet gripped beneath. And Priam heard music afar off. And close behind him he heard rumblings, steamy vibrations, and, as it were, sudden escapes of gas, and comprehended that these were the hoarse responses of the thirty-two and sixty-four foot pipes laid horizontally along the roof of the screen to the summoning fingers of the organist. It was all uncanny, weird, supernatural, demoniacal, if you will. It was part of the secret and unsuspected mechanism of a vast emotional pageant and spectacle. It unnerved Priam, especially when the organist, a handsome youngish man with lustrous eyes, half turned and winked at one of his companions. The thrilling voices of the choristers grew louder, and as they grew louder, Priam Farr was conscious of unaccustomed phenomena in his throat, which shut and opened of itself convulsively. To divert his attention from his throat, he partially rose from the Windsor chair and peeped over the parapet of the screen into the choir, whose depths were candle-lit and whose altitudes were capriciously bathed by the intermittent splendours of the sun. High, High up in front of him, at the summit of a precipice of stone, a little window, out of the sunshine, burned suddenly in a gloom of complicated perspectives. And, far below, stretched round the pulpit and disappearing among the forest of statuary and the transept, was a floor consisting of the head of the privileged, famous, renowned, notorious, by heredity, talent, enterprise or hazard. He had read many of their names in the Daily Telegraph. The voices of the choristers had become piercing in their beauty. Priam frankly stood up and leaned over the parapet. Every gaze was turned to a point under him which he could not see. And then something swayed from beneath into the field of his vision. It was a tall cross borne by a beadle. In the wake of the cross there came to view gorgeous ecclesiastics in pairs, and then a robed man walking backwards and gesticulating in the manner of some important excited official of the Salvation Army. And after this violet robe arrived the scarlet choristers, singing to the beat of his gesture, and then swung into view the coffin, covered with a heavy purple pall, and on the pall a single white cross, and the pallbearers, great European names that had hurried out of the corners of Europe as at a peremptory mandate, with Duncan Fowle to complete the tale. Was it the coffin, or the richness of its pall, or the solitary whiteness of its cross of flowers, or the august authority of the bearers, that affected Priam Fall like a blow on the heart? Who knows? But the fact was that he could look no more. The scene was too much for him. Had he continued to look, he would have burst uncontrollably into tears. It mattered not that the corpse of a common rascally valet lay under that pall. It mattered not that a grotesque error was being enacted. It mattered not whether the actuating spring of the immense affair was the dean's watercolouring niece or the solemn deliberations of the chapter. It mattered not that newspapers had ignobly misused the name and honour of art for their own advancement. The instant effect was overwhelmingly impressive. All that had been honest and sincere in the heart of England for a thousand years leapt mystically up and made it impossible that the effect should be other than overwhelmingly impressive. It was an effect beyond argument and reason. It was the magic flowering of centuries in a single moment the awful sigh of a nation's secular soul. It took majesty and loveliness from the walls around it and rendered them again tenfold. It left nothing common, neither the motives nor the littleness of men. 
In Priam's mind, it gave dignity to Lady Sophia Entwistle and profound tragedy to the death of Leek. It transformed even the gestures of the choir leader into grave commands. And all that was for him. He had brushed pigments on the cloth in a way of his own, nothing more, and the nation to which he had always denied artistic perceptions, the nation which he had always fiercely accused of sentimentality, was thus solemnising his committal to the earth. Divine mystery of art. The large magnificence of England smote him. He had not suspected his own greatness, nor England's. The music ceased. He chanced to look up at the little glooming window, perched out of reach of mankind. And the thought that the window had burned there, patiently and unexpectedly, for hundreds of years, like an anchorite above the river and town, somehow disturbed him so that he could not continue to look at it. Ineffable sadness of a mere window. And his eye fell, fell on the coffin of Henry Leek with its white cross, and the representatives of England's majesty standing beside it. And there was the end of Priam Fowle's self-control. A pang, like a pang of parturition itself, seized him, and an issuing sob nearly ripped him in two. It was a loud sob, undisguised, unashamed, reverberating. Other sobs succeeded it. Priam Fowle was in torture. A new hat. The organist vaulted over his seat, shocked by the outrage. You really mustn't make that noise, whispered the organist. Priam Fowle shook him off. The organist was apparently at a loss what to do. Who is it? whispered one of the young men. Don't know him from Adam, said the organist with conviction. And then to Priam Fowle, Who are you? You've no right to be here. Who gave you permission to come up here? And the rending sobs continued to issue from the full-bodied, ridiculous man of fifty, utterly careless of decorum. It's perfectly absurd, whispered the youngster who had whispered before. There had been a silence in the choir. Here, yeah, they're waiting for you, whispered the other young man excitedly to the organist. By, whispered the alarmed organist, not stopping to say by what, but leaping like an acrobat back to his seat. His fingers and boots were at work instantly, and as he played he turned his head and whispered, Better fetch someone. One of the young men crept quickly and creakingly down the stairs. Fortunately, the organ and choristers were now combined to overcome the sobbing, and they succeeded. Presently, a powerful arm, hidden under a black cassock, was laid on Priam's shoulder. He hysterically tried to free himself, but he could not. The cassock and the two young men thrust him downwards. They all descended together, partly walking and partly falling. And then a door was opened, and Priam discovered himself in the unroofed air of the cloisters, without his hat, and breathing in gasps. His executioners were also breathing in gasps. They glared at him in triumphant menace, as though they had done something, which indeed they had, and as though they meant to do something more, but could not quite decide what. "'Where's your ticket of admission?' demanded the cassock. Priam fumbled for it and could not find it. "'I must have lost it,' he said weakly. What's your name, anyhow? Priam Fowle, said Priam Fowle without thinking. No, off his nut, evidently, murmured one of the young men contemptuously. Come on, Stan, don't let's miss that anthem for this cuss. And off they both went. Then a youthful policeman appeared, putting on his helmet as he quitted the fane. What's all this? asked the policeman, in the assured tone of one who had the forces of the Empire behind him. He's been making you disturbance in the organ loft said the cassock, and now he says his name's Priam Fall. Oh, said the policeman, oh, and how did he get into the organ loft? Don't ask me, answered the cassock, he ain't got no ticket. Now then, out of it, said the policeman, taking zealously hold of Priam. I'll thank you to leave me alone, said Priam, rebelling with all the pride of his nature against the clutch of the law. Oh, you will, will you, said the policeman, we'll see about that, we shall just see about that and the policeman dragged Priam along the cloister to the muffled music of He Will Swallow Up a Death in Victory. They had not thus proceeded very far when they met another policeman, an older policeman. What's all this? demanded the older policeman. Drunk and disorderly in the abbey, said the younger. Will you come quietly? the older policeman asked Priam, with a touch of commiseration. I'm not drunk, said Priam fiercely, 
he was unversed in London, and unaware of the foolishness of reasoning with the watchdogs of justice. "'Will you come quietly?' the older policeman repeated, this time without any touch of commiseration. "'Yes,' said Priam. And he went quietly. Experience may teach with the rapidity of lightning. "'But where's my hat?' he added after a moment, instinctively stopping. "'Now then,' said the older policeman, "'come on!' He walked between them, striding. Just as they emerged into Dean's yard, his left hand nervously exploring one of his pockets, on a sudden encountered a piece of cardboard. "'Here's my ticket,' he said. "'I thought I'd lost it. I've had nothing at all to drink, and you'd better let me go. The whole affair's a mistake.' The procession halted, while the older policeman gazed fascinated at the official document. "'Henry Leake,' he read, deciphering the name. "'He's been telling everyone he's Priam Fall,' grumbled the younger policeman, looking over the other's shoulder. "'I've done no such thing,' said Priam promptly. The elder carefully inspected the prisoner, and two little boys arrived and formed a crowd, which was immediately dispersed by a frown. "'He don't look as if he's had hardly as much drink as a washer bus, does he?' murmured the elder critically. The younger, afraid of his senior, said nothing. "'Look here, Mr Henry Leake,' the elder proceeded. "'Do you know what I should do if I was you? "'I should go and buy myself a new hat if I was you, and quick, too.' Priam hastened away, and heard the senior say to the junior, "'He's a toff, that's what he is, and you're a fool. "'Have you forgotten as you're on point duty?' "'And such is the effect of a suggestion given under certain circumstances "'by a man of authority, "'that Priam Fowle went straight along Victoria Street,' and at Souter's famous one-price hat shop, did in fact buy himself a new hat. He then hailed a taxi-meter from the stand opposite the Army and Navy stores, and curtly gave the address of the Grand Babylon Hotel. And when the cab was fairly at speed, and not before, he banded himself to a fit of candid, unrestrained cursing. He cursed largely and variously and shamelessly, both in English and in French, and he did not cease cursing, it was a reaction which I do not care to characterise, but I will not conceal that it occurred. The fit spent itself before he reached the hotel, for most of Parliament Street was blocked for the spectacular purposes of his funeral, and his driver had to seek devious ways. The cursing over, he began to smooth his plumes in detail. At the hotel, out of sheer nervousness, he gave the cabman half a crown, which was preposterous. Another cab drove up nearly at the exact instant of his arrival, and, as a capping to the day, Mrs. Alice Chadis stepped out of it. End of chapter 4